Good morning, everybody. This is a pre-record, so if you're watching this on Wednesday evenings, it is Saturday, and things may have happened. Why do I say that? Well, today we are talking about Dungeons and Dragons and the OGL, the Open Gaming License. The Dungeons and Dragons community has been uproar in uproar as Wizards of the Coast, the owners of Dungeons and Dragons, have sought not only to uh, push players into their own online VTT, virtual tabletop system, creating their own self-contained ecosystem, but also exclude third-party creators who have been able to produce for over two decades Dungeons & Dragons materials under the open gaming license. The open gaming license being a specific document that gives permission to third party creators to create D&D compatible materials within a certain, uh, how might I put it, a certain limited threshold. So, to discuss this important topic for the D&D community, what the OGL is, what it means for D&D players, indeed what it means for tabletop role-playing games, and humanity in general. I am joined by two of the smartest gamers I know, C. Derek Barn and Discourse Miniatures. How are you guys doing? C. Guy? Oh, the applause, the applause. You got applause. Oh. Yeah, exactly, yeah. got applause. It's not only Jason who has a... Um, who has a, a soundboard now? I have one too. And that's, that is the, the, that's the noise of this this podcast, isn't it? Nye? That is pretty. Wizards. That is pretty much the noise of this podcast when we talk about Wizards of Coast. So, um, I wanted to start off, and perhaps uh, I'll start with Vaughn on this point. Uh, if Vaughn, you could just explain to us what exactly the OGL is and why it matters. I kind of gave a little bit of a brief outline, but perhaps you can go into it in a little more depth. Okay, so the OGL is something that was spearheaded as a license in the year 2000 with the release of 3rd edition. Um, the There's a couple of background pieces of information, and some of this is unique to the u.s copyright system but the supreme court has not has ruled in the united states multiple times actually that gaming mechanics is not uh, a copyrightable um thing now now they weren't ruling specifically on the tabletop industry they were ruling on the board game industry and the video game industry but the ogl is interesting because um what is confusing about tabletop is gaming mechanics and story mechanics are intertwined. So the exact line where gaming mechanics begin and and story mecha- uh, and story content be- begins has never been clearly adjudicated in a U.S. court. And TSR, the company that originally um, produced Dungeons and Dragons um, was notorious for using that vagary to sue everybody. Um, once he, once TSR was corporatized in the, in the mid to late eighties, um, they, I think they sued all their competitors for pretty much everything. There's always, I remember always hearing about, even companies like Chaosium being in lawsuits with uh, with TSR, they sued Gary Gygax. Uh, I, you know, they were sue happy. Litigious, um, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that litigiousness went all the way back to the early '80s with the first uh, third party supplements for the original Dungeons and Dragons, but. Sometimes they would allow it. Sometimes they wouldn't. It was not even. It wasn't particularly predictable. When Wizards of the Coast bought uh, Dungeons and Dragons after TSR went bankrupt in 1996, um, 
Wizards of the Coast kept, you know, releasing some AD&D stuff for a few years, but some members of the company wanted to assure the industry that they weren't going to sue people over third-party production. And they they did a couple of things. It was spearheaded by uh, Ryan Dancy and uh, Wizards of the Coast lawyers. They came up with the with the D twenty system trademark license, and then the OGL. And one of the things the OGL did created a system reference document where they were like, "These are the mechanics and the story elements we're not contesting." All right, and with D and D. This is another thing that makes this really hard. A lot of D&D's elements, both mechanics and story elements, are taken from other stuff. They themselves, back in the PSR days, almost got sued by the token state multiple times. Um, what is it? What is it with companies and taking, you know, previous IPs, if you want to call them that, but previous ideas, and then catching them inside their own properties, and then trying to sue everybody else that uses any any element of that potentially? Yeah, it's, it was, it, it's remarkable, really, isn't it? I mean, they just, I mean, I believe they changed. They they the reason we have halflings instead of hobbits is because of the mm-hmm. Tolkien estate. But yeah, I mean, I think especially in the gaming industry, we've seen with. Uh, uh, with was uh, with uh, TSR and Games Workshop, uh, these companies that have highly derivative properties, um, just suing everybody. But I think it makes sense. I mean, it's the iron law of their business. They appropriate something, and then they try and snuff out their competitors. And you know, you can try and snuff out your competitors by producing a better product, or you could just sue them and scare yeah. them into submission. I get. I mean, it's it just it's just it there feels like there's an element of insecurity there as well, though. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, to get back into into the legal stuff, this is where things get a little get kind of interesting. Um, there, this OGL movement spawned a whole lot of stuff. It created a a glut of material that that actually did kind of become a problem for early wizards. Um, but there was a, there was a, another side to that. And it's a side that I think is kind of, was kind of under talked about, about the OGL. Cause I, I don't, I am one of these people who thinks the OGL was smart, um, as a business move in ways that people don't understand. Um, and what I mean by that is by clarifying that they were going to just state in the system reference document all these things that were they were just going to say okay we're not going to consider these story elements um we're going to license them to you and we're going to license these mechanics to you now as i've said it is unclear what they even need to license to other developers that is completely like someone was asking me for example today if they could claim the the stats as story elements, and I'm like, well, they might could try it, but the problem is D and D stole those themselves from war gaming. So like, <laughs> like there's there's nothing, you know. This was a very ad hoc industry, and and the mechanics law is is generally pretty clear, and and it is kind of the tabletop role playing game industry is kind of weird in that what's mechanics and what's not is vaguer. Um, I mean. I mean, I just want to just ask Disco here, discourse here as a attorney at law or someone who is a recovering attorney at law. What's your take? What's your take on this whole mechanics versus um, uh, story elements discussion? Is it? Uh, I. I, 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 I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to give you like the lamest answer ever and say it's, I, I don't know. It's just super complicated. The problem mm-hmm. is, is that you're dealing with like multiple jurisdictions. You're dealing with a very tricky, mm-hmm. very complicated area of law. And to be perfectly frank, nobody knows. Like that's the thing. Like there isn't actually an answer. It hasn't settled. You know. So that it would, it, it takes courtrooms and it takes legal precedents. And I have no idea yeah, what would it, actually it, shake out. It, it's determined. I, I, I people need to understand this. It's determined by case law, so this is not something like you can look up a statute and mm-hmm. and know. Um, the U.S. copyright case law is somewhat clear about the mechanics issue, which is why like Avatar can't get sued for ripping off Dancers Rules 
Um, boo. Uh, <laughs> I mean, boo, but also correct. Um, but, but, but also, <laughs> Dances with Wolves, can I just say, is not a good movie. And it no, an it's not. Um, it won an Oscar. It won an Oscar. Many bad movies won Oscars. Um, but what are the things that some of the people who've, who have studied this have actually said what Wizards seem to be intending to do was to turn the D20 trademark and the unified mechanics into a like a DVD or VSA, uh, D, uh, DVD or a VHS license um, and thus standardizing the industry where no matter if you want to play a different game, you have to buy their base book. Um, and or you're going to be highly encouraged by their base book, even if there's a lot of like, even if mechanics are explained in other, in other systems. Now, one of the interesting things about this is Wizards of the Coast owns the OGL itself, so they actually own the open gaming license, and that's going to become important later. Um, it it goes fine until 2008. Um, Wizards of the Coast transit transitions to a a royalty free but super restrictive gaming system license um, that was available for third party developers to publish content but it was I mean it, it made it a risk a lot of most of the things we're going to talk about in the in the leaked OGO uh, version 1.1a um, or 1.1 is is stuff that was actually attempted in 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 the gaming system license for fourth edition uh, and that was stuff like if they don't like what you're doing they can ask you to pulp um everything that you're making uh this led to a bunch of companies and most famously paizo itself coming directly out of former employees of wizards of the coast some of which apparently were involved in the drafting of the original old gl um taking their 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 gaming supplements that they had made for for uh D 3.5 and spinning it off to their own system and the backlash against the gaming uh the gaming system license was so severe and also there's some other weird things about about D D forfeit mechanically it was strange um it was very video game ish or well, this was uh, the height. This was the height of the MMO, MMO yeah. world of Warcraft. So, uh, and but you know they uh, they um, they were ultimately unsuccessful and lost their top spot as a role play. Uh, yeah, game. Paizo, Pathfinder overtook them, and it, we need to like think about the the this happened at the time where the ecosystem that currently supports D and D fifth edition was developing. So, for example. Back when no one had heard of a little guy called Matt Mercer, um, he was making, he was one of the first people doing live streams with actor y people who could do good voice acting. Um, uh, for his, Pathfinder originally, actually. I mean, this is yeah. something that's often forgotten. His improv group, I'm telling yeah. you. I mean, uh, do, do you watch Critical Role discourse? I actually don't Me, really. I don't. I don't. I don't never, I've, I've tried to watch it. I, 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 I actually like some of their game products, but I have actually. I don't care about the show. Um, <laughs> but this, so this time period was when I got into kind of Dungeons and Dragons, but mm. I got into Pathfinder. Oh, and everyone you... referred to it as Dungeons and Dragons. So it was like you just play, just played Pathfinder. It's basically D and D, but better. Is kind of how it was right. always like explained to me. And just so people know, basically Pathfinder was kind of an edited version of the third edition of Dungeons and Dragons, and the fourth edition, which uh, which Withers of the Coast produced, while not necessarily being a bad game per se, was very different in its sensibilities. Was very orientated towards online play. And in fact, online playing in combat, uh, on, yeah. online play and combat, and really was a kind of dry run for what is happening now. So, kind of to speed the conversation along, you know, we get into Dungeons and Dragons and Wizards of the Coast 
after fourth edition, they bring back uh, they 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 create fifth edition, which is a little bit more like the older editions, a little bit streamlined, easy to play. They bring back the old OGL, and then you have this whole confluence of forces in the two thousands that leads to an explosion of D and D. People like fifth edition. Uh, you have things like Critical Role become extremely popular. People love their uh, improv, D&D improv group. So they start playing Dungeons and Dragons. You have the rising popularity of YouTube, where you have all these YouTube uh, channels that are focusing on D&D. And in this ecosystem, you're also seeing many of those content creators producing their own materials under the OGL. So you have this huge ecosystem. D&D becomes kind of like a gravitational uh, uh, pull. By having the OGL, people and companies are encouraged to produce their materials to be compatible with the 5e, 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons book. Even companies like Paizo, who produce their own system, Pathfinder, they start producing 5e books. You see a lot of different games having their own yeah. unique system and producing for 5e because 5e Dungeons & Dragons basically becomes, as Wizards of the Coast wanted, a universal language because it is easy to produce for. Yeah, I, I, I want to add one more thing, though, because it actually is it actually is why this is so scary to the community, even if they've played other games. Um, both the OSR and even things that are older than the, o, uh, are in the OGL, such as Chaosium, um, Chaosium Games, Call of Cthulhu, uh, uh, Delta Green, this is a different... All these games have the open game license in them because Wizards had done the lawyer work all the way back in 2020 and if you agreed to using their own ogl you just slap it in your own book and say also we're not going to sue you like mm -hmm. even though our mechanics aren't even related to the mechanics in the open system document uh, one thing i will say another thing i do uh, i do want to add though there were some hints with fifth edition that there were going to be problems later down the line the system reference document as released in 2015 for fifth edition was small so the parts of the game that was going to be allowed out to the community for development was a lot less of the game than they had done in 3rd E. Um, but it really didn't end up mattering. One of the things about it is Wizards was much smarter about not overcreating itself. So the ecosystem actually kind of filled a gap because they only, you, you, Wizards went from release of God and third edition i think they released three books a month and and for fifth edition there is generally only three to four products released a year for the mainline uh rpg and people um, often and people often feel overburdened with that as well yeah so i wanted to i wanted to turn to discourse now so uh as somebody who follows the gaming world as a profession a professional what would we call you a gameographer, uh, a, a game I, I, investigator, I a gameologist, a, a gameologist, a gameologist. <laughs> yes. As a, as a professional gameologist, this goes. What has happened over the course of the last year that has culminated in this massive meltdown in the D and D community, and you know, people turning against Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons. And finally, people will bloody play a game other than D&D. &D. Uh, I can convince people to go, hey, you know, D&D &D are a big evil corporation. Come and play one of my bizarre games about, like, flying monkeys uh, instead of D&D. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> DMs everywhere across the world, you know, have been assembling this this hodgepodge collection of different RPG and role-playing games. And uh, now they're like, ha-ha, finally, this is what I was waiting for. <laughs> Thanks, Wizards. So what's happened in the last year to radically change this? Uh, I mean, in twenty in uh, in twenty twenty one, D and D recorded record profits. It was riding high. They had a lot of good press out there. It was golden. What happened? Well, people. I mean, people love 
Dungeons and Dragons. They really do. And I, I think partly of that is that the audience for Dungeons and Dragons right now is still relatively new. We're still looking at a time when I think a lot of people got into the into the games relatively recently. And so you've got like this big audience of people who are just kind of into Dungeons and Dragons. That might be the only RPG game they know. Again, it's kind of one of those situations where a lot of people get into TTRPGs and they find out about Dungeons and Dragons and they don't know there's a wider marketplace. So I actually think that this this whole scandal and this this outrage at the minute is actually helping a lot of people discover some other companies, which is kind of good, actually. So it's been a long, I think it's been a long time coming. I think that this all started really with the, uh, well, I mean, if you really need to trace a line from something, I think it's probably the announcement of one D&D, the sixth edition Dungeons and Dragons. And new editions of Dungeons and Dragons, I think new editions for most games are usually a pretty scary time for those games companies, because there's this kind of transition period where you've got to onboard people from one game to to the other which means that right now wizards are entering a particularly vulnerable period of time so people heard about one dnd and one dnd as much as it seems to be mechanically very similar to fifth edition it's not like fourth edition it's not like either things are changing radically the the platform the 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 kind of business side of Dungeons and Dragons appears to be changing. They've been emphasizing, signaling a lot about uh, virtual tabletop systems, about playing online, about the 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 ancillary products that surround Dungeons and Dragons, things like Dungeons and Dragons Beyond, where you can manage your character sheet. And I think that some element that, of that is kind of fine. Most people, I know a lot of people who have Dungeons and Dragons Beyond uh, subscriptions. You pay subscriptions to play Dungeons and Dragons every month. Wow. So there's been elements like that. I think that that has begun to push the community slightly in a, a bit of a skeptical position. And then there was recently the uh, Cynthia Williams, the president of Wizards of the Coast, was on a, an investor call with Chris Cox, the Hasbro CEO. The CEO. Um, and she mentioned that Dungeons and Dragons players are under monetized. And obviously that everyone's imagination started to, to whirl pretty reasonably, I suspect. Uh, that was only last month and then and, where, the, and where does where does cynthia williams come from in terms of her business background well, why might she, she, she was originally so she came from microsoft originally she was a vice president at microsoft but before that she comes from amazon uh and then chris cox he comes from microsoft then he was the president of wizard of the coast and now he's ceo of hasbro mm -hmm. so you can see they've all got these shared backgrounds in video games and I, I do think that we can trace a lot of the insecurity in the community back to what's happened with video games uh, as mm -hmm. you know and the monetization that's occurred that we we've, i think we've talked to you about a, a lot on the podcast already but recently then there was a leak of the of the new open game license terms was was leaked out to the community pretty pretty selectively i will say the worst terms were basically revealed and then we've gotten we got a little bit of a drip feed of new bad terms and then boom like out of nowhere we suddenly got the full new ogl 1.1a they're called the new 1.1a terms which make a whole host of changes to to the original open licensing agreement and it has set the community on fire. People are not happy at all, at all. And people have been mobilized, I think, in a lot of ways by influencers, by 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 YouTubers, by third party creators. You know, like all of these people have assembled their own little audiences of people who might play Dungeons and Dragons. They might be Dungeons and Dragons fans, but they're also fans of other content creators as well. And that this is going to directly impact on those content creators in a really adverse way. Matt Mercer, critical role, right? Like there's risks to that company. I think that Wizards are finding out that actually there's a lot more fans in D&D of critical role than, than than just of Wizards of the Coast, the company, you know? Do you think um, do you think Wizards of the Coast have completely misjudged their the place in the market? And if so, why would you why do you think they've misjudged the discourse? And then 100 percent yeah, one hundred percent. So I I think that they so I mean if we look at the background of Cynthia Williams and Chris Cox, I mean they come from industries like Cynthia Williams is from Amazon. She worked there for like for, for a long period of time. I think it might have been around ten years. And Amazon is a company that can force through changes into the marketplace, and there's going to be very little pushback from the community because I mean who's who's the Amazon community, right? Like mm -hmm. Amazon can just steamroll its opposition, but Dungeons and Dragons, role playing games in general 
They are value-driven marketplaces. Consumers in those marketplaces, they want to buy products from companies that they they believe represent and reflect their values. And Wizards of the Coast has misunderstood that because now when they when they're bulldozing bulldozing through these small independent third-party publishers, People see that and they don't like it. The, you know, everybody loves an underdog story, and mm-hmm. demolishing your your competition is is not viewed very well. So they've uh, misjudged the moral economy of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. that's a really good that's a really good way to put it. Yeah, they've misjudged the moral economy. Uh, what about what What are your thoughts, uh, Vaughn, on the kind of uh, actions of Wizards of the Coast to try and force through these changes? Uh, and I, I would say, you know, the the um, the new OGL that has been that was leaked had these terms like you have to pay royalties on a certain amount of money grows. D and D can revoke, you know, can basically stop you producing at any time. They can change their contract within thirty days. A whole host of of stipulations, which, which you know, frankly, honestly, I think many of these stipulations were so bad that Wizards of the Coast knew that people would not be able to produce under this. And then the only people they would uh, work with would be people who would sign a separate uh, bilateral agreement with them. So basically, I mean, and and of course, as, as in our age, the justification Wizards of the Coast is like, well, we don't want people to produce hateful and racist uh, products, of course, a classic liberal business tactic to try and um, try and obfuscate what is ultimately a power move. Um, but, you know, Vaughn, what are your thoughts on the, the misjudgment of, 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 of Wizards of the Coast? Well, there's a lot going on there. I mean, one, the, the, revo- the, the, the one of the things that we, we, we mean to be real specific about the two things that really shock people the attempt to revoke a license that even the designers Rank Dancy and then people at Pazzo who worked with them and uh, uh, Monty Cook, who also worked with them and owns his own game company, all said the intention of this was to be irrevocable. Um, that language was not common in legal documents in, in, 20, uh, in 2000. Uh, it is now clearly common because of some changes in international IP law, uh, but the license is older than that. Um, and the move to revoke it was also going to mean that people were going to have to pulp prior products and take them off the market. Um, so that, that, that kind of hostility, I mean, that, that's, that's bigger than just suing. That's like, we're not just going to, you know, end your company. We're going to bury all your products and by the way since everybody even people who don't use our any of our ip have been using this ogl for years because it's it's this it's the industry standard um of the i'm signaling i'm not going to sue anybody and also don't sue me um it means they can, they can claim all kinds of things from competition th- that even predate, like I said, the OGL. One of the things I think they misjudged, um, and, and their statement yesterday is also a misjudgment, um, because they're claiming, like, we were just workshopping this, and why did you send out NDAs? Like, you have multiple people who who refused they, to sign the nda you they know they asked they asked con- content creators were expected to sign like they said yeah. these are to be signed 100 percent. yeah and and why did you only give them a, a week to to sign a, a 93 page document that completely destroyed people's businesses um uh you were expecting that hasbro is big enough not to be sued um which i was also like that doesn't make sense so so while they could claim like look at new tsr look at legends of the frame although i'm not sure that legends of the flame princess is even covered by the ogl um because osr products sometimes are and sometimes aren't it depends on the company again like i said mechanics particularly old mechanics of a non-active system aren't copyrighted i mean they're not copyrightable in the united states it's a european law is weirder in action on this so it's it's uh and that's another complication is you know yeah 
the, like in the 80s, yeah, TSR was sold in Britain and you could get it elsewhere, but like it's, it, they really only had to deal with two legal jurisdictions uh, or three US, the United States, Canada, and, and, and England. And England had actually usually subsidiary producers who handled that anyway. That's the whole birth of Games Workshop in the first place. Yeah, Discourse's favorite company in the whole <laughs> wide world. <laughs> right. Um, but, but, the other thing that got me about this is I'm like, you have an entire industry that you that you yourself have been encouraging up till now uh, of streamers who you've also encouraged to make content for you. Um, and the I think that's another thing about this. Is it, Watsy also misjudges on employees um, because... One of the things we, we were talking about these presidents, well, they they were hired from outside. The people they promoted were all the people that Hasbro promoted were, were yes, they're all Watsi people, but they're Watsi people who were brought in over longstanding people and and longstanding writers, including the the mechanics writers for D and D one. So I suspect there's also some internal stuff going around about this because it the leaks started being a lot more than creators leaking parts of the the india the attempted nd8 ogl because they refused to sign it and started being like what's the employees leaking <laughs> like the, like discussions that we're having in the business saying that like hey we weren't even told about the o about the ogl changes until it, afterwards and then we were told to clean it up like it does it does seem it does seem like there is actually like a lot of anger within wizards of the coast particularly the creative team and people who come out of the creative team about the direction that these uh executives that have been brought in from microsoft and amazon uh, that they basically they brought these people in they're trying to apply lessons as you said discourse you know like this is how things work to amazon it worked in amazon it's going to work here at wadsey they're applying these and people who understand the industry are like, this is this is my this is suicide. Yeah. And yeah, so I wonder if we I wonder if this will be the blow the, the fallout for this will be so bad that the only way Wizard sees of saving it is actually by making so like booting some of these big executives. Because you know. Perhaps we can talk about uh, some of the reaction of the community to this discourse. You know, like, uh, you know, people we've mentioned, you know, people got mad and, you know, people get mad in all the time in in the Dungeons and Dragons community over all kinds of nonsense. But here there is like they've annoyed their creators. They've annoyed their streamers. But it's not just that they're annoyed. They've actually taken some action and some moves uh, from some of these big creators have been made very quickly in response to these leaks. So could you outline some of that discourse for us? And then Vaughn, perhaps you could follow up. I think the the most important thing that's happened is that people have begun to cancel their Dungeons and Dragons Beyond subscriptions. I think that is actually probably the most impactful thing that has happened. There has been a huge movement to begin canceling subscriptions, which is money directly being taken out of the pocket of Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro. And that actually matters a lot. So you can write like letter campaigns, you can send emails, you can write, you know, you can do all that sort of performative kind of stuff. Companies don't care because <laughs> they will weather it. They know that this this passes, right? I mean, how many outrages, how many, how many community backlashes have we seen in the past? And then it just kind of simmers down and ends. This is this is real because these subscription, these recurring revenue streams, they require people to kind of not that forget about the subscription and just pay in every month and then just not think about it. But now that they're losing a bunch of customers, that's actually really bad. They're going to reacquire those people. So I think that's really important. Uh, secondly, I will say people are discovering a lot of wizards competitors right now. I, I admin a, uh, a Dungeons and Dragons community for like the kind of area that I'm from. And I had to fight personally, tooth and nail, to get a section in our Discord server for other role-playing games, right? It's like, it's named after Dungeons and Dragons. And I had to fight to get a section there. People are whispering me and sending me messages asking me like, are we going to change, like, can we change the name? People want to change the name from Dungeons and Dragons to just like tabletop role-playing. Because 
suddenly they have realized what it means to have a single company be the custodian and steward of a hobby. What, how it can go really bad when they feel like they're in a position to push things as far as they want to. And now people are, are beginning to actually support other companies. I mean, this is exactly what happened, as Varn mentioned. This is exactly what happened with 4th edition as well. People moved from Dungeons & Dragons to Pathfinder. And honestly, Paizunai as well, they've come out with the Orc, their new open gaming license as well, which is essentially a replacement system. And they have joined with Kobold Press and Chaosium and Green Ronin and all these other third parties. And they have completely pulled the rug from other from under Wizards of the Coast now. And every, they're getting such great press out of this. I think more people are finding out about Pathfinder over the last week than had ever heard of it before. I mean, I've seen, a lot, I've, I've seen a lot of creators, for example, who do D&D uh a content um i i forget who i what i i saw a video from the the dungeon dudes i don't know if they're friends or a couple but the dungeon dudes they do pretty good content and they were talking about five rpgs that you've uh never heard of i have i have that video written and recorded i just have a chance to get it out and edit it <laughs> yeah but, i mean <laughs> yeah but it's it's really uh i mean to return to the whole moral economy issue is you know, in a lot of other gaming uh, spheres, in, in, in video games, for example, you know, there is a lot of, there, there is a small elite of players in video games who are super engaged in video games. But most people who play uh, computer games are basically just like logging on, playing. They have no engagement with the companies. They don't care who EA is. They don't care about anything. They just want to play their game and turn up. With something like Warhammer 40,000 and Games Workshop, they have the sunk cost issue where you have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars. So you are you're in for a penny, in for a pound. Once you're yeah. in the Games Workshop ecosystem, you've bought all your models and you just like, well, I need to play. But and Games Workshop have refined that customer base over a very long period of time. They've whittled it down to the last the last few people who are like, thanks, Games Workshop. <laughs> are you, are people, you know, Games Workshop YouTube channels are basically, you know, a lot of like, give me the Space Marines. I love the Space Marines. I need more Space Marines. I'm telling you, man, I love them. So they've really, they've really done that. But it's yeah. partly because people have... Uh, I need my space marine, daddy. Give me my imperial fisting. And um, th then... Um, yeah, I wonder who that could be. No one. <laughs> um, uh, no one that could be no one. The... Um, the um, uh, but it's because people sink a lot of money into it, right? Mm -hmm. But Dungeons & Dragons is, in many ways, a lifestyle brand. The Watsi people understood this, but they misunderstood the attraction of what that lifestyle brand is. A lot of people who played it, D&D did a lot of work. And, you know, I know that you have the old grumpies who are always like, oh, they've made like elves black. How can you have a black elf? It's like it's elves. They don't exist. They've done a lot of things to promote diversity, which makes sense. They have like the, the community, I would say, is generally open. It's kind of a progressive community, at least in terms of its values. You know, I know a lot of trans people who play, uh, a, a lot of LGBTQ people play, and increasingly, more and more minority uh, people from minorities are playing, and it's kind of uh, uh, grown in that way. That doesn't jive, right, with the we're going to crap on your favorite creators, because of course, a lot of the popularity of Dungeons and Dragons is created through these parasocial relations with content creators, especially Critical Role. I mean, they they talk people talk about you know the Matt Mercer effect as a, a, a Matt Mercer, the 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 head of Critical Role, the GM for Critical Role, has shaped the way that people perceive Dungeons and Dragons to be um, uh, how it should be played, and. What's he totally misunderstood? They were thinking, oh, they say D and D. That means they love D and D, the brand. But D and D for many people is just a generic term for role play game. It's like saying Hoover or Kleenex or Band Aid, all these kind of things, yeah. and they misjudged it. 
can I can I can I just say that I don't think that the Dungeons and Dragons IP is particularly strong. Honestly, I think the misjudged the strength of their IP. I, the most people I know who play Dungeons and Dragons don't really care about like Forgotten Realms or mm -hmm. you know like they they're not they're not they're not invested necessarily in the world like the setting and the kind of characters like Drizzt or whoever they what they care about are their Tibbles version of Dungeons and Dragons their Tibbles version of the, the homebrewed world that their dm has made i mean sure it might be still forgotten realms but it's their dm's version mm. of forgotten realms it's their dm's npcs dungeons and dragons is a is an engine it's it's mechanics that that's what people have actually latched on to that's what they use they use it as a toolbox to build their own little you know to, to build their own little games and so i think that they have misjudged because they think they have something like warhammer where everybody just wants space they, they just love space marines but that's not the case with dungeons and dragons that, that's not the case and, and wizards don't have the strength to be able to just push through changes like this yeah they, they seem to strangely like both lean into the progressive values and, and i want to say some things about progress you know I, i'm all about you know, against progressive values i think diversity is great but a lot of creators and a lot of the fan base learn that oh i mean literally they were really naive but they learn oh you can use oh you can use progressive values as a censorship thing to like censor whatever you want like like yeah you know i've heard more people say this week like oh they could have always just told people to who used their stuff for racist stuff to cease and desist actually like like um the ogl if it wasn't irrevocable in general i mean if it's irrevocable in general it was also irrevocable in specific um i mean revocable and not irrevocable revocable in specific to specific people who like new tsr who was deliberately trolling stuff um and that's woken a lot of people up to the fact that a lot of these companies uh pinkwash uh greenwash etc um and, and very and and use it for other things and i think that's that's a that's that's a new thing. And I think, I think one thing we need to note about that is there seemed to have been a campaign that D and D launched on its own history. Simultaneously, there was all these like think pieces that had industry people coming out talking about like, Oh, our race is history, but you should play basically, you know, D and D one has gotten past that. Like um, we have excise Gary Gygax, which I also find kind of interesting. Because they also the... sl slandered the OSR, the independent RPG community, as being like, oh, the... I mean, the OSR has some pretty gross people in it uh, in the past, but like, that's a tiny minority of these independent R RPGs. But definitely, I think it feels like there was some kind of campaign to do that. I agree. Go ahead. I mean, even if you look at the statement from Wizards yesterday, if you look at their their response to the kind of OGL backlash, they open with a discussion on we needed this to prevent racism and and you know uh, bad community content. Like that is their first justification that they have for trying to prevent third party basically for trying to update the the OGL terms. Then their second one is NFTs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which NFTs like, of which the only people who have ever talked about Dungeons and Dragons NFTs are Hasbro, <laughs> and they said they're looking into it. <laughs> so, right, right, yeah, and the last thing they mentioned was major corporations, and I'm and as I mean every source I've seen as I've mentioned this, the biggest corporation that their competitor Paizo has one tenth of their staff and one one hundredth of their income flow. Like, five million. They're they are five million. Paizo has got a net worth of five million. Hasbro is eight and a half billion. Wizards of the Coast are one billion, like or, or five billion. Yeah, or no, one it, billion. Yeah. It's what it, but I mean like the, the, the order of magnitude difference about that is 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 nuts to me. And while a lot of their statements seem to clearly be like, I'm not gonna say Paizo, but Paizo, they're also kind of clearly, I'm not gonna say Matt Mercer. But Matt Mercer, which I think, which I'm like, that you are literally killing the primary thing. And I couldn't figure out what they were trying to do, because one of the things that they seem to do that this, we talk about their overvaluing of the IP is they seem to really think 
that there's that their new growth in in independent markets is based off of pre third ed TSR nostalgia. All right, because that's that's and I say that because it's also shown up in their product links in weird ways. Like one of the things about Wizards products is they'll mention stuff from like 1985 in a new book as if they think that anyone now is going to know that I've been playing DD uh, D and D since like 1989. And I don't know some of the, like, I don't know the ins and outs of Greyhawk really. Like I know it exists, but <laughs> I think, I think that people like the idea of it. Like I think that uh, based mostly on stranger things, I think people like the idea of that kind of old, you know, old school kind of role playing, but actually most people just want to make characters and, get the dungeons you know they don't want to do a bit of murder hoboing in yeah, a dungeon I, there's no nostalgia i don't think really there's not a lot of it i definitely think i mean i think the covert uh pandemic was far more important than nostalgia of course there's a bit of 80s nostalgia yeah. but when you had a bunch of people coming uh coming into the hobby because they're stuck at home and they play on zoom or one of these vtt's like um roll 20 you know, I think that was far more important for giving people time to say, hey, you know what? I enjoyed playing Dungeons and Dragons back in the day or Dungeons and Dragons seems pretty cool. Or my friends are playing Dungeons and Dragons because, you know, even by the 90s, things like Dungeons and Dragons were far more mainstream than they had been in the 1980s. Role play games, you know, like I know tons of people who grew up in the 90s like me and they 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 knew Warhammer. They knew role play games and they weren't like oh you're the role play game nerds i mean i remember funny story in 2001 watching a vampire the masquerade uh, t uh, uh group go to a nightclub and beat up some punks in a fight you know so it wasn't like the preserve of nerds or something it was like relatively mainstream and people started playing and wizards of the coast miscalculated because People were playing online, but just because there's a computer involved, it doesn't make it a video game. Yeah, it, it, it's an analog hobby, and so, people play people play online because you can't be close to the people you want to play with all right. the time, and it makes it it facilitates play. But ultimately, that play is still analog play, and this whole move towards video gamification shuts down the creativity that uh role play games have like the point of a role play game is that your dm can do whatever you're not do anything limited. i can change at, it at any time exactly so, so i want to talk about the role play uh, the, the video gamification and in particular my thesis that modern corporate people are even are dumb even for corporate people um <laughs> because one of the things that has been the D and D uh, the Watsi's frustrated with right now, um, they released a whole bunch of video game content, licensed a whole bunch of video game content. They lost money on it. They gained, however, a whole lot of stuff over over COVID, as far as the the doubling of book sales. But they've had trouble with book sales this year too. And one of the things that I've been pointing out in their new releases is they video gamified the rules and also have been releasing books that don't have complete mechanics um so i like so it's like well how do we play from the books which makes it seem which i think was getting beginning to get backlash from the nerd crowd because they were realizing that like you really couldn't play a lot of this stuff unless you went into D D one where where their gamified ecosystem would finish out the mechanics for you um and while this year has been particularly a nostalgia year, two out of three books are like, oh, we're bringing back Star Jammer, which, you know, for a nerd like me is aimed at nerds like me. But then we get it and like, well, you, you didn't even finish writing the book. We're bringing <laughs> back Dragonlance. But you like there's key there, your rules in that book and your world things actually don't match up. And. And what I find particularly fascinating about this is part of the reason why Wazi's why Wazi was having trouble, despite making a ton of money off of the expansion of like base core D D and the and the online in the online D D you know facilitated world and also in hard in hardcover books, um, is that it was the video games that lost the money this year. 
Like it specifically was the video games that lost the, that, that lost the money. So I was like, why on earth, if you are seeing that your video games are losing money, are you going to try to video gamify again? Um, the, 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 the potential the is there. Playing yes. It's the potential for so much money, like times a million money, right? Like if they can, if they can sell every single player who currently doesn't, those mean old players won't give, give Hasbro their money. They, those guys don't want to pay any money at all. If they can convince those people to spend even $5 a month, right? This is why D and D beyond cancellation stuff. They're so big right now. Uh, if they can get them to pay $5 a month and if they can find the odd person who'll pay hundreds of hundreds, hundreds of dollars you know on these kind of things that cost almost nothing to make it's worth it then right like because then yeah. then the, the the actual find is so much bigger so one of the things that i was looking at uh, for that call that I, i've only seen one person mention but i found it on the call is they they said they wanted the average player to spend the same amount as the average dungeon master right now um which I will say, as a dedicated dungeon master and also a book addict, um, that moves the hobby for for something that like, that does seem actually like a, a very games workshop move, where we're like we're going to eliminate the size of our audience so that we have an addicted audience, um, and monetized. And fully monetized down to microtransactions and and NFTs. But again, but again, it, it misjudges the market because one of the attractions of D and D is that the GM, he's kind of like a he or she is kind of like a groomer. You groom people. Come on, come on, <laughs> come and play some Dungeons no, you and Dragons. Up, you don't want to use that word. <laughs> yeah, you, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe, maybe the the uh some kind of uh, synonym for groom but <clears throat> it is very much something where you as a gm bring people into the game and the attraction for players is that it is exactly a low investment thing like yes. they get, it's it's like it's free it's like you're you get a book I mean, you get a book, your imagination, and you talk and you create a collective story. Some people like to do a bit more of the combat. Some people like to, the, but it misjudges. Like a company like Games Workshop, foundationally, everybody playing a Warhammer game needs the minis, right? So, you know, you can't be a passive Warhammer player. I mean, you could be a lore consumer and things like that, but, you know, you can be very into D and D for very little money. And if you're not super wealthy, that's like an attractive, like not all nerds are middle class or upper class. There's a lot of people who want to play done, uh, play role play games who are not super rich. And Hey, the DM has the book. He or she is going to give me the photocopy. So I do my character sheet or we go on the thing and that's all I need to do. And that them trying to monetize it, misunderstands the game that they have well i mean i get but my um, i think my big uh put like thought about this is like despite the fact it's a lowly monetized hobby you guys have managed to turn a business model that frankly the reason why like most of these like paizo it, you know is worth five million which is big but not that big and only has like 100 employees is because it is an old school market that has never been very like even in the the height of 80s d d and d where you can get like d and d stuff in the sears fucking catalog for christmas uh it, like it's never been easily super monetizable um and when wizards has accepted that they've actually made a ton of money like that's the funny thing if you look at the history and 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 i think one of the things that's going to really hurt uh wizards now is now people are learning about the history of DD &D who weren't particularly interested before because now i've heard a lot more people bring up fourth edition i've heard a lot more people bring up the old tsr wars and i'm like yes, oh D &D it's tighter yeah the old it, virtual tabletop attempts <laughs> right um and i was even going to mention gene because I, I think the story of a lot of our show when we talk about these these like 
hubristic big companies. I mean, we can always mention White Wolf. Uh, so far, any one of them that tries to put a ton of investment in 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 a digital market, be an MMOPG or anything like that, that they completely control, they go out of business. Like, I don't think that's going to happen with D&D, but I, I'm just looking at the history and going like, they, I get the temptation, but like, look at the history here. You guys go out of business when you do this. Like, um, and the why I think the trust is so particularly hurt is, like I said, now people know about stuff they didn't know about before that have like, because the goodwill around around the, I think that's what they were hoping is there's so much goodwill in this other community that they're just not going to learn about the, like the fact that this, like this kind of move has collapsed the hobby. I mean, you know, particularly in the nineties, it almost completely destroyed D and D as a thing. And for, and, and while, you know, you have to be old to remember when, when I was in my, in my twenties, um, if it wasn't for 3.0, nobody still played Dungeons and Dragons in the 90s. Like, um, it was a it was a time where every yeah, pe- like you are 14 year old and you're trying to get your hands on Palladium or or something like that. Like, um, and immediately I knew how serious it was because all these things have been marketing D and D based stuff forever. Uh, but by Tuesday, we're already like, find your non OGL games. Here is uh you know shadows of the demon lord and fantasy age and um all this stuff that a lot of these even a lot of these third part uh third party publishers who had their own games have kind of like not really invested in because no one's been buying them and everyone's like like fantasy age sold out like <laughs> yeah. like i haven't I heard anyone I- talk about fantasy age ever like <laughs> I bet I bet Paizo are getting a big bump in sales. Oh, I, I mean, I, I, Monty Cook started sending out free versions of Cipher System and put Cipher System on sale, and also reminded people that Cipher System has its own and separate OGL. <laughs> like I just was like, <laughs> everybody else has been like, "Hey, we got games, and we're gonna sell them to you for cheap. We're gonna loss lead right now, so you know, so that you get into our system and our game world." Like, Isn't this though almost like a return to normality? Like, is it, I mean, in a lot of ways, the actual dominance of Dungeons and Dragons over the entire marketplace was kind of the weird bit because yeah. for the longest time, it was the key is that there was a variety of co- competitors inside the market. Like, even in the 90s, like White Wolf was arguably one of the biggest TTRPGs at the time, but there was a ton of variety then. In the 2000s, it was the same thing when fourth edition came out. And then for a while, there, it felt like all anybody ever wanted to talk about was fifth edition dungeons of dragons and it felt like the the hobby the role-playing game hobby had ossified around this single game system and now wizards have accidentally (laughs) they've accidentally dropped the ball so hard that that they've shattered their hold their shackle hold and now everybody's finding out about these other games and Uh, it could be that we see the return of that variety i think i think you're right i think uh i mean i think a hundred percent. We see this in a lot of other fields. We see this in wargaming. The dominance of a single com- company leads to a kind of conservatism in rule design. Uh, uh, rules bloat, very common uh, in these uh, kind of things. And 5e was getting that way, right? You know, we saw um, uh, we saw with 5e, you know, when 5e first start it's not the greatest rule system of, of all time but if you just have those core books it's a pretty solid rule system and it's easy to teach people up. and there'll be people who dog on 5e but it's like no it like part of its success was because it had a reasonable system but we've seen this expansion of subclasses and you can you got the you could play a turtle or a cat person all kinds of stuff right all kind, and I think yeah. Once they get into this dominant position, uh, they it becomes game by committee, uh, and you end up with kind of a a, a moribund uh, gaming system. And also the gaming world. And I think you're absolutely right, this course, to highlight it earlier. They didn't. Um, they overestimated that how people care about their IP. Like they're investing in this D and D movie. 
It's going to bomb. I am pretty sure. Yeah, I've D&D. never known a D&D movie to do well, and there's been three. Why? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think one I, have, of the, I think it might do okay. I think you think so? Well, I think it yeah. might have done okay. Like, I don't know that it's still going to do it. I mean, um, they've really, they've really, I mean, I just, uh, it's an engaged community, right? Like, it's quite involved to be a rpg uh, it's not something you can just passively consume without, you know, investing yourself in. And they've just misjudged it. And I think, I think ultimately, I think it's a scary time for a lot of third-party creators, people who have built their careers on it. I mean, you've got your Matt Colvilles, you've got your Matt Mercers, people who are veterans of the industry. Who, I mean, Matt Colver basically called this back in August when, when, when. Um, D, uh, Wizards of the Coast bought D&D Beyond, which, despite the name D&D, was originally a third-party yeah. um, uh, company. When they, he called it that, you know, they're going to try and tighten their grip on things. But then you have a whole bunch of people who are online creators. I mean, I've seen people who, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say 100%, I'm sure, but like, it looks like they've been crying for like four hours because like they're like because their livelihood is going to be is it, it, here here's the here's the crazy thing right this 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 imp, there's already been a massive impact on the industry by the existence of the leaks of the OGL 1.1 there have been uh, third parties have had to cancel projects uh, there are freelancers that have already lost gigs and jobs as a result of this yeah. sponsors have begun to pull out i've already seen like sponsors have begun to pulling out like this has already made a massive impact third small third party publishers have had to hire lawyers to try and work out what the actual impact of these of the the new OGL will be and that has been a, had massive reverberations on the wider market yeah. already, and that's any, before it even has come out. Yeah, that any any Kickstarter right now that was, I mean, you you, I think the real gloat is has like, I I used to try to keep up with all the the five E Kickstarters. I didn't invest in all of them and at least follow them. I can't even follow them all anymore. But I every one of them is in doubt now because like. Uh, because a lot of people are like, okay, it takes a year to get some of these things out. Are you even going to be able to get it out with this OGL kerfuffle? Um, you know, are, are you going to go out of business if we actually got you big enough to really ensure a good product? Because I don't think people understood, you know, understood this at first. I'm like, but the the uh, the the OGL is at gross revenue, not profit. So like, and I don't. You know, the profit rate for physical commodities and publishing is real low. So, like a twenty-five percent royalty on gross, on gross, you're driving is, your, you're driving them out of business. Basically, you're yeah, driving it, all but the biggest people out of business. Right, and and a lot of the and, and and so if you're you're a single creator gets a big Kickstarter blows up, you actually probably won't be able to to deliver the kickstarting product. Like, well, it's everything. It's everything above seven hundred and fifty thousand. Well, yeah, but have you like? I'm just thinking. You you do a thousand book print run, um, on a hardcover book like that. Uh, everything above seven hundred fifty thousand would have been still every major fifth ed, uh, Kickstarter this year because most of a lot of them hit a million or very close to it, well, and. They probably didn't. They're probably not profiting more than 10, no. 15 k off that. I mean, people. Yeah, people see these big million dollar kickstarters, and they're like, "Oh, they must be rolling in money." It's like they're not. I mean, a lot of that money is going into production, right? There's some profit, and you can run a company, but you're not like living. You're not. You know, you're not in a private jet off. You're not a Hasbro executive. You're not a has seven hundred thousand. A, a year <laughs> yeah like i don't think i don't think matt colville is flying around america in a private jet because of strongholds and followers right um you know people people see big numbers but you know i mean both Val and i have worked in publishing and we know how crappy the margins are and we produced really poor quality books right <laughs> you know like the the cheapest the cheapest crap Right. I mean, the the quality demand on RPG books. I actually, I actually was pointing out this has been pro- a problem for like uh, drive through RPG for a long time because their their print on demand stuff can't deliver the quality people have actually gotten used to. But like, 
I, I pull out books that I have from 80s RPGs or 90s RPGs and even early aughts RPGs. And I'm like, no one would accept this now. Like, they're going to want a full color book with like with stitch bound. Uh, and I'm like, dude, even the biggest companies in the 90s did not do stitch bound. Like, like, so people stitch have bound to is make... nice, though. It's nice. It's not. Bound. No, I'm I'm all about it. Like, don't get me wrong. I I now don't buy books from Drive Through RPG because they they fall apart. But um, that was the industry standard in the '90s. Like, like it. There's a reason why it's kind of hard to find some of those books now because they just weren't made well. Um, but uh, that's become like normalized. Like, I mean, like I even think about like the OSR community, like th them in particular. You better have a nice book, like a, a nice physical book, which means your profit margins are going to be low. Um, and and that's I mean, that's OK. I mean, people can live off that if they do three of those a year, you know, make 20, 30, 40, 20, 30 K off of it. You support two or three people working on it together. You, you know, you can do that. And that's been the, the mainstay of the industry now. But it's. Like I, I am like, because I was reading this. I'm like, you know, th that seven hundred fifty thousand sounds like a lot, but if you've worked in public, in publications, you just know that like, oh, unless you're doing, unless you're doing print on demand, you you can go through that. Like wait, that. wait, Farn, are you saying that all these these Kickstarters are are not by massive mega corps? Is that what you're? Are you saying that they're? <laughs> Not huge commercial companies. I mean, you know, you know, the, the biggest companies don't use Kickstarters. I like I like to point out Pazo doesn't kickstart stuff. Uh the, the biggest company I know that does consistent Kickstarters is Cobalt. Like mm. um and, and but these and, these are these are minnows compared to the oh, Hasbro. They're tiny. They're that, tiny. I mean, yeah. I, I mean it's just it's just the marketplace. I mean, frankly, <clears throat> I think Going forward, Wizards of the Coast is going to try and roll this back. They're going to try and, as they say, polish the turd and say, and and perhaps put forward another OGL that has slightly better terms in the hope that people will go, oh, at least it's not the terrible one. But I think they... Well, so they're calling it OGL 2.0 is what they're... Because I might have had a little document sent to me um, falling Ooh. into my lap. And the uh, it matches essentially what the they had said in their statement, their public statement on D and D Beyond. And there are some walkbacks and some some points. The royalty fee is now been amended from twenty five percent to twenty percent for everybody on anything over seven hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, but, although the, what's funny, their statement made it sound like they weren't doing royalties at all. Yeah. Oh, well, there's no royalty structure, so you know it's all good. Uh, but there's really been very little substantive changes. I think there's been a lot of performative changes. So, for example, they they spend an entire paragraph trying to make clear that oh, you still own everything, but that doesn't matter because if you're signing away the rights and you're allowing them to monetize it, you know, and license it without your, you know, without any. But is the back license like still approval. in there? Yeah. They so I don't see, I haven't seen the actual legal document. I've seen an FAQ, like a document that seems to be, have been appended onto the new OGL licensing. So it's kind of a clarificationary. Document. Well, there was, there was a, a leak, an apparent leak to one of the D&D creators from someone within Wizards of the Coast who was saying precisely that Wizards of the Coast leadership thinks that they can weather this storm. Yeah, and they might have thought, well, we have to react. We can't. I mean, the the storm has been bigger than we expected, and we have to react. And their reaction will be slightly to amend things. Uh, what do they call it in um, in, in negotiations? They call it anchoring, right? Where you give, mm -hmm. where you make a very like big claim, and then when you roll it back to it's a compromise. Then it's a compromise. Then so right. they're trying, they're trying to do that. I think, and I and I, you know one thing I'm hopeful for. I think, I think the D and D community, and the, and this is what I've actually said for a while. And people have, you know, people in some of the forums and the discords have been skeptical about it. It's like, I'm like, I don't know. I think the D and D community is uniquely positioned as a, a as a hobby community compared with other hobbies, anyway, to push back on companies like 
uh, uh, Wizards of the Coast, uniquely positioned. And if the community and the influencers in particular, who who are really the people who, they're the people who people have the parasocial relationship with. They don't have the parasocial relationship with the abstract brand of D&D. They have it with these people that they follow, they know, and that, and that they trust, right? I mean, I love me some Matt Colville. He's my hero. I want to be like Matt Colville when I'm when I'm fifty. That's my Matt aim. Colville and Monty Cook are my are, are my people, and like I was already loyal to Monty. But that's that's Who, neither who's, here nor there. Who, who's your favorite discourse? Since we're having f- Jim Murphy. That's who Jim. I want to be. I want to be Jim Murphy. Matt Colville's DM. DM. There you go. Yeah. So be, DM so, like it's 1975, baby. <laughs> but this, I mean, people. So those. Community leaders, like if Matt Mercer comes out and says, screw you, D&D, I'm going to play Pathfinder. He's not going to lose his audience, right? Like the audience is not, they're they're, they're his audience, right? You know, there's a a reason that they have their own Amazon show that did okay, right? Because, you know. I did actually hear. So I did actually hear um, one of the big podcasts. So I don't listen to a lot of the D&D podcasts. One of the big podcasts did move from Dungeons and Dragons once. I think they moved on to a different system and their audience levels did drop. Uh, I think it might have been the Acquisitions Incorporated podcast. Mm -hmm. They moved to a different system and that actually did result in, 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 they went back to Dungeons and Dragons as a result. Yeah, there is actually, there's another show that that moved. I can't remember what it is either because I don't listen. I listen, I I listen to some gaming industry podcasts, but not the, not the, I don't like listening to other people role play. Um, uh, What are the things that, that, what are the guys moved? One of them moved from, from they they moved from D and D and lost people, but then they didn't gain them back when they went to D and D, so they moved off anyway. So so I I do think, but I don't think that'll happen now, because mm-hmm. I, like I mean like if you look at YouTube right now, I think people who like don't even care about D and D are hearing about this OGL thing that they've never yeah. ever ever cared about. Um, and I mean it was in the Financial Times. I read they had a story in the Financial Times about it. Yeah, it, it's gotten beyond Gizmodo, um, and yeah. so it, it's it is, uh, it, it and a lot of these things have, have exploded. Um, and I also think one of the funny things is there is a book about D and D's history that actually makes all this stuff really clear. That's also come out right right now, uh, the Slaying the Dragon book, which is talking about like it's about their legal history. And I'm like, oh man, I bet that guy is really actually ironically happy right now. Cause yeah. like, like, there's gonna be a lot of people like, wait. Um, and Watsy, Watsy's destroyed a whole, it's other property this year already. Oh, yeah. Magic the Gathering people are mad too. Um, and Magic the Gathering's been struggling for, for a while. I mean, like, it, it, but, Magic the Gathering did have the, um, it had the collector status and the secondary market for Magic has been insane for like 20 years, but, um, it also had recently, people were telling me it had the same dynamic as, uh, as Games Workshop where like, like they were monetizing it to the point that a lot of people were having to get out of it because they were, otherwise they felt like they were just losing money and being addicted. Um, and so I, I just, I think like they Hasbro owned, uh, owned uh, Watsy has totally lost trust in two communities and, um, and they've done it kind of the same way by like, trying to be the only game in town ha- having monopolistic practices etc um uh you know and i think that's fair i mean one thing i, I will think people need to notice too you, you're right about the monetization um, i suspect for watsy that the books are a loss leader um because not if you buy them from from like you know mom and pop stores you're gonna pay 60 bucks for them but on amazon they're the cheapest role playing books available. Like they're so deeply discounted. Um, yeah, well, definitely those starters packs are as well. 
Yeah. Um, so I, I have, I figured that they must be like not making a whole lot of money on the actual book end of it anyway. Um, so it's, 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 in, it's interesting, but I do think, you know, I actually, I, I agree with you, you discourse that I think this is going to be fairly good for the community because one, there's going to be another OGL that's not owned by anybody. I mean, if you think about the thing Paizo is doing, is Paizo's like, and we don't own it and we can't change it. And we're actually going to put all the language that wasn't in the OGL in it and leave us alone, but it's there. So please buy your stuff. Like, cause <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, like that's, <laughs> it's look, the, the market forces make it for them. So we're coming up. We've been, we've been on this for a while. Discourse. Do you have some final thoughts to leave us with on this whole situation? Oh wow! Uh, the, I, I think I, I've final. got a lot. I've got, <laughs> I've got a lot of thoughts, but I will be, I will be brief. Uh, I think that honestly, personally speaking, I have been a little bit inspired by the by the D and D community. I genuinely was surprised to see that there were so many people that had been angered enough to take actual concrete actions and do things like cancel their their subscriptions. Genuinely, I was surprised. Maybe I've been maybe I've been in war gaming for too long and I just thought that like nothing would actually come of this. There'd be some performative rage and then that you've would been, be it. You've been yelling into the void about games workshop. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh my God, finally. <laughs> <laughs> actual actual action. And one of the things is as well is that this is this has come at the possibly one of the worst times for Wizards of the Coast. Like you guys mentioned about Magic the Gathering, obviously in a bit of trouble, but also moving in towards 1D&D. They need to transition people from Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition to 1D&D. That was already going to be a little bit of a task. Now it has become a nightmare because you're going to have people saying things like, well, if we're moving system... Right, like, why not? Why don't we maybe try out this Pathfinder? I've I've heard all about recently, right? Like, so I think this is a very dangerous time for Wizards of the Coast. I don't know, maybe maybe it's a management issue. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. So, with that no optimistic note, um, I want to thank everybody for listening on the podcast. If you're watching on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Remember to like and subscribe. Check out Varm Vlog. Check out Discourse Miniatures. Check out Dungeons and Discourse. Discourse Dungeon. Uh, the Discourse Dungeon. Dungeons and Discourse. Discourse. The Discourse Dungeon. <laughs> That's what I'm going to call it. The Discourse Dungeon is where <laughs> Chris Catrone takes people to read Lukash. Anyway, uh, the um, the uh, check that out. And I believe I think uh, on the on Sunday the twenty second we will be doing another live play live stream of a TTRPG, which is not owned by Wizards of the Coast. We'll be playing Mothership, which I think is a really cool space horror science fiction. I'll be honest with everybody, I'm not super into the fantasy stuff. When I do prefer the science fiction stuff, but you know. It is what it is, but as we say on This Is Revolution, we are out. <laughs>